everybody for coming out. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I can, you can, I'll call you up or you can hang oh, out yeah. right here, oh, you, you know, if you want a more dramatic introduction, you know. Um, yes, thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is Garrick Imitani. I'm the chair of the MFA in Visual Studies program here at PNCA at Willamette University. Um, I want to start off by thanking Hannah Bach and Morris for organizing this event in conjunction with Converge 45 and director Derek Franklin. Unfortunately, Hannah could not be here to give tonight's introduction, so I'm filling in. Um, our thoughts are with her and her husband right now who got in a bad accident, car accident, but is recovering, and um, we wish them well. Our thoughts are with them. Um, I also want to just thank you for coming out and supporting this lecture series um, and supporting the work of visiting artist Rodrigo Valenzuela, whose new work is truly stunning and currently on view just across the atrium in the main gallery. Tonight is the final time to see the work, and the gallery will be open um, at the conclusion of the talk for a short period. So do make a point of going and seeing it before it wraps up and ships to Vienna tomorrow. So I also want to mark your calendars for Monday, October 16th. We'll be hosting a talk here in the Media Tech that features artist Amanda Ross Ho in conversation with Catherine Taft, Deputy Director and Curator of LAX Art. This event is organized and produced by I Love You Too in conjunction with Amanda's exhibition currently on view until October 28th. Uh, we're honored to host this talk and be included with programming I Love You Too is enabling for our MFA and Visual Studies students. Um, I Love You Too will also be hosting special hours from 5 to 6 prior to that lecture at 6.30 uh, on the 16th. Um, of course, no talks not complete without some acknowledgement to the fact that we're on uh, indigenous land. Um, obviously, a lot of these, these acknowledgements can be really performative, so I do want to call attention to some of the work that is on the floor here at PNCA. There's a pretty amazing uh, ongoing indefinite exhibition on the ground floor here of several um, regional indigenous artists. Um, in, in addition, currently at the Confederated of Grand Ronds uh, Chichala Museum, there's a current exhibition co-curated by Felix Furby and Anthony Hudson, both enrolled members of the Grand Round. Um, Anthony Hudson's an artist and alum of PNCA, who's also known as the fabulous drag clown Carla Rossi. This exhibition focuses on the indigenous queer history of the region and also features the work of Steph Littlebird, who's also a PNCA alum and a member of the Grand Round. And that exhibition closes November 9th, so I encourage you to get out there and see that. Um, so I am really pleased to introduce tonight's artist. I've been a fan and been following Rodrigo's work for a number of years now. I remember seeing Rodrigo's work in person in 2014 at Clark College, just across the way in Vancouver, Washington. And I walked away really impressed by the number of threads he was able to delicately weave into the work made both individually and in collaboration with students at the college. There was a stark confrontation with reality that was presented through video and stories of exploitative labor and class, which also existed alongside more elusive and effusive representations of these same ideas. In this work, questions arose about the distinctions between artistic and manual labor, as well as uncompensated collaboration versus contracted labor. What resulted almost 10 years ago is something akin to what continues to happen now when I see Valenzuela's work. A consistent reverberation between outside and inside spaces that playfully and purposely mirror outsider and insider forms of knowledge and lived experience. By continually moving between spaces of the gallery, the studio, the landscape, the street, and the interior or exterior dimensions of a body. As viewers, we also travel through multiple lens of looking and inhabiting different socio-political conditions and realities. By luring us in with beautiful and seductive images and objects, we're made to look closely, ask what we're literally seeing, including what may be, may be lying beyond the staged frame. As our attention is called in, we become called to question the often delicate delineations and lines between uh, institutions and the spaces we occupy, that we support, we beautify, beautify, or purposely let crumble or fall into ruin. I've always found Valenzuela's work equally stunning and striking, and thoughtful and compelling, and through his own words, he's partially attributed his process to a background that includes academic studies and degrees in art history and philosophy, 
prior to receiving an MFA in photo media from the University of Washington, as well as accounts as an illegal day laborer in Boston. For over a decade, Valenzuela has been prolific and has a very long list of accomplishments and recognition on a national and international school uh, scale, which I won't cover in totality here. Originally born and raised in Chile, Valenzuela currently lives and works in Los Angeles, where he's an associate professor and the head of photography at UCLA. Valenzuela has been awarded a 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship in Photography and a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, a Joan Mitchell Award, an Art Matters Grant, an Art Trust Innovators Award, and has a number of recent solo ex exhibitions that include at the New Museum in New York, uh, Lisa Kandelhofer Gallery in Vienna, and in Oregon at the Jordan Snitschew Museum in Eugene, uh, the Portland Art Museum, and just up north at the Fry Museum in Seattle. Um, again, could go on and on and on. It's a very long and extensive bio, but I'll stop there and ask you to join me in welcoming Rodrigo Valenzuela. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi. Oh, there is no volume. Can you? Could you raise the volume of the? Maybe I have to do it here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I thought I was being really smooth about it, but it's not happened. Uh, what? Are Oh my God, and they changed the... Uh, oh, there, so. Um, amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, see, it's not working. But it's fine. The video is very good. You're missing it. Okay, so let's do something else, okay? Because I don't want to fix technical problems now. So I'm not going to show you any videos. Um, and I'm going to, you know, because I've seen most of, like, 90% of the people here are, are MFA students. So I'm just going to talk uh, directly at you. I thank you for the introduction. It's very lovely. And I hope everybody have the chance to see the show. Um, when I was, um, uh, the, the show that you were talking about, Clark College, I, I got this opportunity so to go to Carson this is here. Like, uh, it was very amazing because I just finished grad school and I kind of didn't know what to do with my life. And I was just to uh, make this body of work. And then uh, I just got. I think. I think I got really lucky in the beginning of my career because I, I went to grad school in Washington, tried to develop a practice, figure out how to make art, and and in bit, right after grad school, I I went to Escohigan where I met Ralph and I got and I make a lot of my closest friends right now. But even then, like as I said, I study art history. Because I thought you needed to be really, sm I, I thought you needed to know about art to make art. And it's, which is a complete logical thing if you grew up, you know, if you don't know the artist, you know. Uh, and then, then I study art, I study art history, I make a little bit of art, and then I move here, and then I meet more artists. So I decided to study philosophy because you needed to be really smart to make art. And then it's just like, you know, you always think you need something else to make art. Or you're just waiting. So, like, I feel like most of my 20s, I was waiting for something to happen to allow me to make art. Does that make sense? And I think that feeling is very recurrent. Mostly when you grow up without, 
like a big cultural background or with a rich family or with going to see art and whatever, whatever, whatever reason that many artists have. Most artists don't grow up around art. So, um, but you know, I went to Escojigan and I met a lot of artists that were very dedicated and they have done this career that was, you know, Cooper Union undergrad, straight to Yale, so like, you know, like a mix of Mica and Columbia, like a, like a whatever mismatching of like successful artists, right? It's like, and it feels like a, like a recipe. You just put water, go to Skohegan, and then you made it, right? But so I, got, I met a lot of people, and I was like impressed, but also I was like, and that really, that moment really liberated me to make art, because then you meet like 60 artists, and they're all kind of doing it. And you realize like really few of those people even read. And then you're like, fuck, man, I just waste like 10 years of my life just like trying to get smart. And these people are just like, just making whatever, you know? <laughs> and so I really, really wanted to like, so and after that was like a very, but during this coherence, still I was like just going around the studios and kind of like making other people's work, like I was shooting their videos, like documenting their work, and I was kind of like figure out what other artists do in their studio, which is still is a thing, you know, when, when you're like, um, like a student or try, a young, young artist, you get mad because people are not showing you work because you think your ideas are great, but you still haven't made any of those ideas, yet you just think they're great, right? And then you're like, what the fuck? Look at this thing in these galleries. Why they are not showing my work? My work is so great. And then you have no work in the studio, right? You just think it's great because your ideas are great and the things that you talk with your friends when you're drunk are interesting. <laughs> but they are not, uh, you haven't made anything, right? So like, and then, but then you start really thinking what artists think in the studio. And then that kind of like really, uh, to me now, I never get mad at galleries or curators or whatever, right? Uh, because it's just a market, right? It's a thing that happened in a, in a shop. They are like a business. So they just show whatever is going to sell. And most galleries, if they could sell couches for $100,000, they would be mostly in the couch business. You know, like there's like, so, but when you see artists not making art, it's really fucking annoying. Because it's, it takes so long. It's so hard to make art that like, so I'm then saying this because there is so many trends, so many things, and whenever you you watch a lot of people making work, you realize it's a very kind of clumsy exercise, and you require a lot of kind of like courage to just like not knowing what you're doing, but have a lot of trust in this. So you know, like uh, like what I'm talking, what I think is, uh, for example, these things I was doing in Esco in Escohigan. Right? I really, it was the first time I had a studio, like a cubicle or something like that. But, um, you know, in a lot of times, like, and because of artists, you know, now I teach and I have a lot of students, a lot of artists gonna be like, you know, they, 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 they fantasize with the intellectuality. They're seduced by name dropping certain things, knowing about some books, but they really don't wanna read the whole thing, right? So a lot of the time, artists feel that they ask you for the cliff notes of like contemporaneous, right? Or like how to be a smart person without how to do the whole labor, right? So, so a lot of the time, people is like, how do you use philosophy in you, in your work? Or like, if it's helped me at all, right? And it doesn't. Like, you can, I mean, there is some artists that will talk about Marlo Ponti or Heidegger and whatever, right? And I think during the like mid 2000s, there were a bunch of people making work a lot about kind of like object oriented ontology or whatever masturbation about objecthood that they were like here, like, so it could happen, but it's usually really boring, right? But the thing is like, the thing that you learn with like studying a lot of like this text or trying to, you just really learn how to read and how to process ideas, right? So, so like, um, so when I make this work, for example, right? I have been making for, for my, I used to make this because I didn't know what to make, so I was like working construction. I was like kind of throwing, uh, this is kind of undergrad work, so right, uh, so like throwing sticks, and I, uh, like, and kind of doing this performance for the camera, and whatever, 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 but like I really didn't know what to make. And I have this, all these landscapes, right, uh, from Chile, that they were these kind of like amalgamations and like these 
desert, right? And I was really thinking a lot about this idea of place that doesn't really exist because they're like fake, right? They're like a combination of like the Atacama Desert, the Eastern Washington and random stuff, right? But they're romantic, they're beautiful, but I was like, I, was, I didn't want to be that kind of photographer, right? Um, so you start thinking through the materials in some way, right? I was thinking, okay, these places that don't exist, they're in my mind. Uh, because, and it's in everybody's mind, right? If you, if you move to America, like when I just moved to USA, I moved to Boston, right? And then I moved to Seattle. And then I moved to Houston. And now I live in Los Angeles. Like that is like four different Americans, uh, Americas, right? So like you can't say that like you moved to USA. A lot of the time, the only thing you need is like a cousin in a weird, like I did this residency in Omaha, um, at Vemi Center for, Contem for Contemporary Art, and it blows, I mean, I don't know if it happened to you guys if you are a foreigner or immigrant, but when, when you meet some foreigner in a place like Omaha, it's like fucking blows your mind. Because you can, you can pick any place. You, you don't have any relatives here. Like you can, you could have picked any place. And then you find them in, in Iowa, in like whatever place. And it's, I, like because I do these lectures a lot, it just it blows my mind. It's like, that is what you want. This makes you happy. And it's fascinating, right? What you, come, you feel comfortable, you know, your soul leads you to some places. So basically, to me, becoming an American or becoming a resident, it was this landscape, this idea of coming to America, plus a lot of paperwork, right? So. I start making these photo, these landscapes make out of photocopies because to me photocopy is the material of bureaucracy, right? It's how the power keep your press and how you know if you are familiar with something, it's with paperwork and bureaucracy and like a lot of handling of things, yeah. But you know, then you have that problem. But like now I understand. Oh, the, the material is good, the idea is good, something working, I like it. But one of the things I didn't like to make work in Chile is that in Latin America, and not anymore, but I mean 20 years ago when I went to school in some way. And it happened in some other places too. Um, like if you make work, uh, what I didn't like that these photos were referring to painting, right? They were like an optical illusion and stuff like that. And in Chile it happened a lot that like if you can make reference to a famous painting, then you're a good artist. Like, right, if you can make a photo version of uh, The Rough of the Medusa by Jericho, Jericho, you're like fucking amazing, right? If you can make uh, some sort of like high minded reference to art with a new medium, with 3D printing or whatever, you're like really good. You know what you're talking about, right? And I didn't want that, right? I, I, just, I really wanted to think about photography or think about the, how to individualize the medium and just really make it not painting, just, you know? Um, so what I'm saying, what I was referring to the idea of the philosophy thing is like, and something that drives me insane is a studio, peop, in a studio in you guys' studio, for example, um, that you go to some artist's studio and then you encounter like four or five projects like I'm finished. And, um, and this is where like reading comes handy, right? Because it's like or learning how to research. Because it's like, if you, you start a project and then you say, oh, it wasn't working, so I start a new project. Oh, this wasn't working, so I start a new project, right? And I made the equivalent, if, if I stop every single time I didn't understand a sentence in a book, you could have a pile of books and it could be really ridiculous that like after three pages, I was like, not reading that book anymore. I didn't understand one, like one, one line, right? You just develop the skills to learn slowly, to search for secondary, you know, literature, whatever it is the thing that you need. So basically what I'm saying is like, I knew that was something good, but uh, yes, I don't really believe that there is bad ideas. So I just needed to like figure it out what is the perspective and how is the speed when I'm reading these images, right? So I decided to, the only move, the, the, the most radical move I could do is was like, yeah, basically zooming out. This is my first solo show that I ever did. I was like, and I, I'm really, I still, you know, think a lot about it because it's kind of like, uh, with a few times I work in color too, so like, but also it took a lot of the elements that I know were working, but also I wanted to evidence how they work, how the images are made. So I start making the images, I start kind of like also letting the viewer think in the way I think, I, I see the work. 
So because also, as I said, I, I, because I don't trust this idea of talent in some way, like, like I think if you think really hard about the images, you can get there. But ultimately, you know, like there is a talent, there is a natural talent to things, but you are a viewer too. So if you, you're a maker, you still there is a point where you have to go to the studio and it's like, is this fucking painting beautiful? Is it cool? Is it good? And if you're not asking the very simple questions like that, then it's like, it's just kind of like a complete, like you are, if you're only trying to put a point and if this, you could understand this painting if you read this one thing, blah, 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 blah. Or if you have met my mom, you could understand this thing. It's like, you know, it's still the like painting, the thing need to be like the coolest shirt you have seen, you know? And that day, maybe there is limitations, but eventually you're gonna get really, really good. But you, you, know, you start making stuff that like kind of satisfy your eye, satisfy your mind, and then you can move on. Right, and then there is new inquiries open later. So, I mean, with this, mo you know, sometimes you make work, and then you're just making it because you kind of like need to make some stuff. And sometimes you got this work where, like, I was making this movie called Maria TV, and, and Maria TV was this little homage to my mom and my 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 mom, my aunt, my my sister, my grandma. I grew up in a house with like five women, so I was a so I watched like basically my whole life was like just getting from high school and then watching operas with them and just kind of have like tea and then just kind of hear gossips, right? It's like, it's truly like a weird version of like, a, like an Almodovar movie. It's like, that was like my whole childhood. I was just telling my friend that like I, I thought I was really good at dancing until I grew up, until I get older and I was dancing with, with real people, with other, with other girls. <laughs> And then I realized I didn't know how to, like I, I, my, ma, my sister and my, my mom used, to meet, used me to dance, but I was never leading. So I was, I was like, I was waiting for people to spin me around and to like dip me. And like, I was like, I was so embarrassed that I was like, now I never dance because I was like, at least you're leading, no, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> like, so like I, I really like soap operas, I like the vibes, right? so I was making this soap opera. And I, and I hired these guys to make the screen. The, the, the green screen. So the, inter the, the thing is like you make a work, right? And that work is interesting enough, but maybe it's not good enough to be a full body of work or actually a work of art, right? So I took this picture and I was like, okay, uh, the disappearance of the labor um, need to happen. I mean, these people need to leave, literally. Right? But also their job is painting the screen green perfectly. So the screen can disappear, and these workers will disappear, right? And I used to do something like that when I lived in Montreal uh, when I was younger. I moved from Chile when I was 21. I moved, I lived in, Mo in Montreal for a little bit, and I used to clean offices in the, in the middle of the night, right? So like the custodian. Um, so I'm very aware that there is like so many jobs that like they're like, they only, you only notice those jobs where they are not happening, right? If, if, the, if the custodian is sick, then you notice the custodian job exists, right? So I was taking a picture of complete disappearance before disappearance happened, right? So I, I will show you, and that is kind of the first idea for the show at the Fry Museum, that my first museum solo show that I, I, I had, and I think the first time I was actually ambitious with uh, something. And then I make Maria TV, which is like this telenovela from Chile that like, oh, this no. So I tell you while this happened, right? It's like I hire 15 mates to learn the script of the telenovela and reenact it. And eventually, and in between, I mix it with their stories. So sometimes, so eventually, you don't know which part you're listening and what part you're following. But also, 
me you encontré con un país really donde really había mucho racismo tanto en un trabajo como en la sociedad y uh, I wanted to point at the flaw, media representation este, and the flaws of representing working class women on TV super adelante sin ayuda de so, nadie It's like a 17-minute movie. The, all the videos I want to show you, they are like HD, full length in my website, so you can just see them for free. Y nunca tuve el apoyo como en nuestros países, de nuestros padres, de tener una madre, una amiga, alguien que me ayudara a saber cómo proteger ese niño. Y yo veo ahorita mis hijos grandes, uno que ya se graduó y uno que está en la high school, y me veo fuerte. Y mucha gente que me conoce me dice, eres fuerte, eres... Siempre empezaba en un trabajo desde abajo, siempre dishwasher y era manager, housekeeper y era manager, y yo sé que soy fuerte, pero en mi vida personal siento que no lo suficientemente fuerte para decidir y hablar por mí. Y entonces quisiera tener ese poder de decidir de no tener miedo a mí misma, de cuando yo decida algo por mi vida, sea porque yo lo estoy decidiendo por mí y no por miedo a hacerle daño a los demás. Yo quiero a mi hijo. Por lo tanto, te vas a quedar aquí hasta que nazca. Quiero que te cuides para que nazca en las mejores condiciones. Quiero que seas fuerte. Eso es lo único que te pido. No vas a volver a mirarme la cara. Ya no tenemos nada más que hablar. Vamos a esperar el nacimiento del niño, eso es todo. ¿Y después? Después tendrás que irte. Es lo mínimo que te puede pasar después de todo lo que hiciste. Te vas a ir para no volver nunca más. Y te olvidarás de ese niño para siempre. So they repeat, repeat, repeat the, the, the same action. There's an acting coach that kind of like helped them to prepare. Um, and eventually, basically, they, they are just bad at it, but they, they, they got... Um, de nuevo te dio una oportunidad y me mentiste otra vez no puedo creer en ti más porque de nuevo me vuelves a mentir so they all take turns to like kind of talk to the camera so like you know to let their anger out and then that's kind of so as I saying the, the first uh, chance I have to think about this invisibility of the labor came mixed with this idea that like I finished my photo MFA and I really wanted to make photos um, and, you know, it still happened, I mean, a little bit, because I, I, I ran this program, uh, photography, at UCLA, which has a great tradition, supposed to be one of the best programs in the country for photo, and, and I never get anything with photography. <laughs> so, like, it's kind of funny, because I, like, I have getting awards for a sculptor, for painting, for stuff like that, and it's like... And I was like, I, I wanna, I develop, I, I pay so much attention to photo. Like I just, and I feel like, and it's good thing eventually when people are like, no, but you're an artist. And I was like, no, I'm a photographer. And I, no, no, you're an artist. And I, I like photo. Like I really wanna be in the, I, I really like that. I, I, you know what I mean? Because I think there's a lot of room for growing and there's like a lot of uh, interest about, you know, reality and truth and things that the 
painters don't really have to address, and I really want to address it with photography. But also, I was like, I was young. This, you know, this show was like 2014, and I was like um, thinking a lot about. Uh, that was annoying that there were so many painters, so many photographers doing ruined porn, like going to Detroit, Pittsburgh, and taking pictures of like abandoned buildings. And I was like, what the fuck? That is so, so easy. Like, you know, it's like the, the camera needs to be broke to like take a bad picture of an abandoned building and sunset. Like, it's just like, <laughs> but, and then people get awards about that. They get, they get books about like going to get the, and then you can be like, oh, my, flip, my family lived there. My, grand, my dad used to work there, whatever, whatever, whatever. But ultimately, they, a lot of them don't look the same. But this is the thing where like, you have to, you, you can't give up on a subject just because like other people that make it is an, an annoying or you don't like it or never looks good, right? The, the subject here was like, to me was interesting also to analyze why I get so mad about this kind of shit, right? It's like I could just not care, but it's like I want to take pictures of ruins, but like how do we understand ruins? You know, I mean, it's a relatively young country, right? But it's not a old civil, it's not a young civilization. People, things were here, right? And then you go to Mexico City and there is ruins downtown. You go to Lima, there is ruins downtown. You go to Italy, there is ruins downtown. So how do we understand the decline of architecture with knowledge, right? Why, we don't, and like it's America, why, why America doesn't want to learn from the past, right? So I was mostly thinking about like, okay, I, I don't want to go and take pictures of an abandoned building. I don't want to take pictures of like, uh, I don't want to like aestheticize or fetishize what it used to be somebody's community, right? Um, but I was interested in this, what is the minimum gesture of feeling that required for something to be considered a ruin, right? There is things that look like a ruin, but they're not a ruin, right? And there is things that they, because I, our minds are so institutionalized that we think that something are ruins, but other things that also fall in the same earthquake, they're not ruins, right? Other things that were lost during the war, they're not ruins, right? An hospital is a ruin, your house is just shit, right? So like there's something about it that like we will conceive, but I wanted to search for that feeling, right? The feeling that you can start considering something a ruin. And I think that is the interesting thing about an artist. It's like, like making something kind of like, like kind of adding to the conversation in some way, like uh, uh, the, what, what else, what else can be a ruin, right? And why, you know, uh, why we need them, right? I mean, the, I named the theory the, the, the hedonic reversal because of that. Like, hedonic reversal is this psychological condition where you like pleasure, where you search pleasure in pain. Not necessarily sexual, but like if you like a spicy food or you like to watch sad movies, and you, is, is this kind of weird sadness makes you feel alive, then you are like a reverse hedonist. Uh, so yeah, I mean, a lot of the time we identify, which is like a, a weird thing I have with pictures too, right? Like uh, it seems a very kind of silly question to say like, what, what is the real thing, right? But we do have a problem in photography with reality and we do have a problem in contemporary society with what is real in terms of like, uh, for example, speed of thought. Right? Like you consider, I mean, the way I shoot, right? If you consider this, all these images are kind of shoot from the same vantage point, right? And I want to show you more pictures that are all shot from the vantage point, and I want to show you more pictures that are all kind of shot from the vantage point, right? Um, I, I will, uh, I, we think, I mean, you know, you consider immediacy as real. And a lot of the time, people have like been fooled by photography by thinking that this decisive moment is the thing that makes somebody a good photographer. But also, we think it with politicians, like somebody that like just say that shoot from the hip or talk from their guts is like more real, right? And like uh, the immediacy of like, what's up if you go home and think about it, and you come back with an answer? Is it more real that saying what you meant, and not just what? first thing you thought, like, right? So there is like a something about with the slowness in the way I work that I, I, I like to think about the reality in those terms, in like very slow reality. So I make also a video, uh, speaking about the, the you know, this, um, the cleaning crews I was telling you, like, 
you know, now this is like why you can win. I just gonna because I don't have that much time. So, so basically, I follow the clinic when I was teaching at Rice University. I was teaching drawing, so I was thinking a lot about drawing, but also I was uh, I, w I I have access to all the facilities. So I, I I told them that I was a professor at Rice. So I so they let me follow the cleaning crew after the, the football games. So it was a three channels video, one during the day, one during the night, and, and I hired one of the cleaning crew members to come to my studio and draw the strategies that they used to clean the, st the stadium. But I overlap it with a, with a coach giving a pet talk. And if we do that as a team, they wait, they take their time so they can prolong the hours. Instead of five hours, we may stay for about eight, nine hours and make $30 for three hours. 30 bucks, I can manage 30 bucks. Right, so I'm, you know the funny thing about Rice, this is the same, I'm, I, I'm, I think about the video, I wanted to make the video, completely thinking that I would be documenting a lot of Latinos, I mean it's Texas, and I thought it would be, I would get along, I'd make other, other kind of pieces, but it was mostly older black men because um, they, they use the sketchy system to hire people where most of these guys are, just coming out of prison and they get paid under the table and I don't know how right how the university does it to like get this thing under the but it's like that why they go basically they go pick them up in like under the bridge and then all la or labor centers and then just like they're all these guys ex inmates or the, in, in parole or stuff like that and they, they only they only the only people there's even immigrants will not work as low as pay like I seen they pay them like six bucks an hour or something like that. So they are like, that's why he's telling me that they work, they, they, they have to stretch the hours because they, I saw the guy basically drop them in a, in, a, in a truck with a bunch of trash bags and there is one or two that the kind of captain team and the rest and then they, he show up like midnight to pick them up. And, that was, and then they just, you know, I just show them leaving the work and stuff like that. But it's truly impressive. But, you know. So, I, so uh, this is another example, right? I, I moved to Houston, and I have lived in Boston and Seattle before. And I was thinking a lot about, um, uh, and, and uh, my girlfriend at the time was in, in Richmond, Virginia, and I visited Ralph a couple of times there. He was teaching at VCU. And it's the first time I saw all these, like, all these monuments, like, right? The things that people complain now, right? Um, this is in 2014 too, so I was like, uh, I, I saw them and I was like, that is fucked up. But then you think, I think about back home in Chile, like every subway station has a colonizer name, like every plaza, right? So you can be mad, but you know, this is thing, like maybe some, I don't want to talk, maybe it's your favorite artist, maybe not, but like, I feel like doing something to them, like, Painted, covered it with fabric or whatever, that is what bad artists do. Like if you like do something to the stature, if you put a flag or whatever the fuck, it, 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 that is like, it's kind of thinking, it's, like, it's centered, the, it's recentered these guys in the pro, as a problem, right? You keep thinking about, like if I wanna do something, if the work of art gonna be so unimportant as we consider like, you know, what's like, there is an artist but you don't know them so it's irrelevant in your life, right? So if the work of art is gonna be not super relevant in some way, like might as well just try to figure out how to make progress from that thought, right? How to live a life without these guys. I can, if I can make it in one piece of work, fucking amazing, right? But I don't wanna go home and keep thinking about some racist guys, some colonizers or whatever, right? So the question for an artist I feel is like, what do you think is a, I mean there is two questions, right? There is a question of like, what takes for anybody to stay in the public consciousness, right? Because you, might, you want it or not, um, you grow up around these people. Like if you come from the South, or you grow up in, like in, in, in a city, you know, um, you grow up around those guys and they become a landmark. And you have no agency when you're young. So if you're a teenager and you wanna make out in the, in the, by, the, by the feet of like some really racist guy, you will not say no to that little chance. It's your chance, it's your high school crash, it's the Hitler monument, and then you're just gonna like go to, you know, you're just gonna do it. 
because there is no way you can. But and then they become part of your consciousness. Your good moments are associated drinking beer by the foot of the, you know, by the horse of Pedro de Valdivia or Cristobal Colón. You have no say in those things, right? So it's like how we manage to be to any of these people to get them out of the public consciousness. Um, I, I was thinking, what is a monument for me? Something else I grew up with, it was these animitas, these roadside altars, these things that they are for people that die, you know, in the, in, in the neighborhood I grew up, there's a lot, people get shot, cars, stuff like that, right? So, and sometimes, so for me, that is a real monument, right? It's like an, a, a structure of love for somebody that don't, you don't care about their ego, you just want to make them present in public. And that feels the dry gesture to make art too. So, so what I did, basically I made this uh, sculpture um, kind of like, and I, and I make something that could look almost like an, uh, like an Ikea version of like a monument. So you could just give it to people. If your kid die or your mom die or so, and you want to make a memorial site, you can have all the qualities of a monument without any of the problems, right? And sometimes I, I show the, just the, 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 the wall texture to like, because I wanted to put the pictures and I wanted to confront the scale of what this was the thing and depicting in the photos. And the photos eventually they become this like, all the ways you can make these four or five walls into, uh, into a memorial site. Right? And I have so many more stories about this project because I was so incredibly broke when I was making it. And I keep showing it, right? Like when I showed it in Houston, I thought it was great because, oh man, I made it thinking about Houston, I made it in Houston, but people in Houston don't want to address the issue, right? It's like, shh, no, we don't talk about that. They don't, no. Then I moved to LA and I showed it in LA and people were like, great, oh, people in the South are so racist. Oof. <laughs> and then like, so, I, but still nobody gonna buy stuff because nobody wants this sad shit in their house, right? <laughs> But then I show it in Austria, and Austrian people, they know they fucked up. So they are like, yes, yes, I want it. I want this thing that reminds me of my sadness. And like, I did really great. I got good press, and I got a bunch of sales. It's fucking amazing. Like, but also, but you know, I mean, this is, and I say, like, no, no, because money or press is indicative of success. It's because I was convinced that the work was interesting, and I wanted to talk about it. So. Sometimes it's not gonna work in the house. If it didn't work in Houston where I completely thought that I was talking about them, to them, and then I have to drive it in my truck to LA and show it and I still nothing sells. And at that time I was a full-time artist so I needed to sell one or two pieces to pay rent, you know, to eat some food. So, and then there is a, and in order to show it a third time and fly with this wall and the pieces to Vienna, it was kind of like a, you really have to trust the work or the idea, right? You can't just like, oh, nobody liked it. In the same way that for you guys want to show one or two pieces and then in one creed and maybe in the, group, in the annual show and then you're going to be like, oh, everybody saw it. Pfft, I'm not going to show it. And then you don't want to show that piece anymore, right? There is a something about like keep showing it, keep talking, having different conversations that is very, very important because finally, in, uh, yeah, I, I believe in it enough to like wanted to fly around the world with it. In Kala, Art, uh, in Kala Art Institute, I was making this residency about, and, uh, and where I started a lot of the, doing the research for uh, the labor unions. And I was making all these paintings of flags of disappeared labor unions. Uh, the light tables that you see are, are these, um, it's how the place was lit, but also they were light tables. They were with a, with a slice film that I have collected. I have made all these photos of a, uh, during the, the archives of Cesar Chavez and uh, doing the newspapers and the, far, the, the farmers um, uprising. So I was making all these flies. This is in Utah, in like Salt Lake City or something like that. So I, I, it's like I show in so many weird places. It's like, um, and together with this, I made this video, right? Where like, it's my version of uh, 12 Angry Men where like 11 workers are convincing each other to form a labor union, right? So they just like. Como latino, como americano, ellos me pagan, yo le hago su trabajo, lo hago de lo mejor que puedo, 
y págame mi dinero y ahí estamos en paz. ¿Entiendes? Mañana, si te gustó y quieres que yo vuelva a... Necesitas mi servicio, aquí estoy yo. Si no, mira, dame la mano y ya. Pero no me debe nada. Compañero, pues tú a un compañero, un compañero hispano, pues no lo vas a apoyar. Sí, Mira, eh, eh, yo, yo te voy a decir algo, porque eso ¿sí? es una, una cosa. Porque estamos hablando ahora sí eh, del sindicalismo de aquí nosotros, okay. de todos de aquí. Si tú no eres, tú no eres unido con todos los, los hispanos, no, no los vas a ayudar, le vas a dar una patada por el rabo. No. Y órale. No. no, es para ayudarlo. Ayudar a uno y darle, decirle, ¿sabes qué onda, compañero? Vamos a salir adelante, vamos a dejar eso, vamos a echarle ganas, vamos a hacer lo otro y órale, vamos a estar unidos, porque unidos siempre vamos a tener la fuerza, si no, no la vamos a okay, tener. Ok, mira, déjame decirte porque yo he aprendido en este país, ¿ok? A eso mismo. Tú, en este país, tú tienes que sacar las uñas que tú tienes. Ok, tú no puedes esperanzarte a que yo te ayude, ni que el otro te ayude, ni nadie. Porque como tú viniste a este país, tú viniste solo. Again, this thing is like making all these workshops. I, I hire, uh, they're all unscripted. And, and what I do in a lot of the movies is ask questions and kind of have a conversation off camera, but I subtract my voice. So it's never something that they didn't want to say, something that they don't believe. And then later with the months, I edit and I construct these conversations among them. And this is, I mean, in that case, they were actually having the discussion among themselves, but you know, like a couple of beers and a couple of good questions, they will get people going and they will just like be themselves. So it takes like a couple of days sometimes to get comfortable, but um, yeah. Then Trump got elected, right, in 2016, and, and, uh, and, and there was the marches. This is some time I get in trouble, but I hope don't, don't take it too personally. But if you've been in other parts of the world, <laughs> like you realize that uh, some marches in USA are very cute. <laughs> and, like, and then some marches that are real, you know? So, like, uh, so I was like, um, which is nothing to do with the, the, um, the pink, um, the, the women's march. It's mostly about the spirit of things, right? It's like, up until Black Lives Matter, probably not, most of you guys haven't seen real protests. Like, people fucking shit up, right? And that happened in Latin America all the time. Like, for no reason. Or sometimes for the bus ticket, sometimes for the train ticket, sometimes for student loans, sometimes for everything. People protest for everything in Latin America. So when you see something that needs to be like, somebody almost destroyed the government, and then you finally are like, okay, we can do it on a Wednesday. Like, <laughs> it's kind of, I mean, during those protests where like, you have to buy something at the, pro like if you have to go with your credit card to the protest, it's wrong, right? If you have to buy a hat at the protest, if you like have to, if you're gonna get a free Uber ride, they were like free Uber rides or something like that to the protest, it was a fucking insane, like. But, you know, there is nothing wrong because if you understand something as like, you don't have to protest because everything for more than you think is fucked up, it, things kind of work. And it, relatively, there is a lot of social trust and you can, I mean, when I move here, like, I remember my, my sister and my mom visited me in Boston, like it was 2005, so then, like, little things that like seeing the red envelope in a mailbox and no one is stealing it is fucking insane. Like, Netflix just being dropped by the house and no one taking it. Like, you know, you really believe in society and it's fucking crazy. And it's, I love it, but, you know, sometimes it's too much. <laughs> uh, so, like... You know, like it's almost you can't protest on a Wednesday because you want to lose your job and you don't have really good health insurance and your credit score going to get affected and it's just like so much work. So it may be not a language. So I think protest is also a language, it's a style. It's a, it's a thing that you learn how to do, right? So basically, and at that time, by chance, I was reading, I was rereading the um, Paulo Neruda's uh, Canto General. It's this like big, fat book of poetry that he wrote, and in the book, he talks about that it's, a, it's one of the most epic and well-known anti-colonialist poems, right? But the send up this uh, uh, protest is very hard to protest against colonized colonization with the colonizer, in the colonizer language, 
right? So there is not another language to protest the colonization, that is Spanish, right? So in this case, like I was thinking, oh, maybe you need to learn a new language. So I was like looking at images of like, maybe America need to learn barricade st styles and protest styles to see what works. Maybe, maybe a good slow down. If you are really concerned with productivity, maybe super slow down. No, it didn't happen until the pandemic where you start hearing a lot more about labor unions. I've been like insisting in these things since like 2014. It's just, like, you gotta unionize, you gotta fuck shit up. That is all you. So I start making like models or types of barricades in the studio with clay. Again, because in the book, Neruda talks about like Latin America being this giant coming from the ground up. So I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna make everything with clay. And also because I was talking to one of the students today, sometimes when you, when you grow up poor, you have this anxiety about labor. You know what I mean? Like only European guys can put like an apple by the table, by the corner of the table and then be like, that's the work. That is the art that I wanted to make, right? Like sometimes when you when you're poor, or you you have to write a lot, work a lot, or like evidence the labor and somehow, right? Make the big paintings, touch every corner. So I still have some sort of some somewhat of that anxiety. So I want to make every object in clay and then rephotograph it and photograph it and rephotograph it, right? So I was like making casts of chairs and stuff like that. And you know, I was, at some point you start running out of time, so the, the, the molds are just wet, you know, like in that, that, that cone. Um, and sometimes you just put the mold because it's just too late, you know, like the, <laughs> the tire is just there. Um, and at the same time, you know, we have this mask in Latin America that they're like for protests, right, that you can make very quickly uh, with like random materials that you find. So together with that, I start making my own self-portraits with reflective tape and this mask. I just cover the whole gallery with clay and I put the pictures up and um, uh, this is, I think, 2016, late, late 16, something like that. Also, you know, yeah, I was, uh, I was yeah, thinking a lot about uh, communication. I mean, this is, there's a famous tower in Chile called the uh, Santiago de Entel Tower that is uh, telecommunications. And a lot of places, a lot of cities, like in Tel Aviv there is one. A lot of cities have a massive center tower that kind of like become the, the kind of like nodal point of society in that city. And um, so I was making a, maybe a small replica of this bird's eye view perspective of the tower falling down as a symbol of communication and stuff like that. Um, and this is the Jordan Schnitzel Museum I, I show. So the curator of this show have, a, have, a, um, um, have seen the Fry Museum. Remember that show with the scaffolding in you know, Seattle? So she was like, I want you to take over the whole museum. And I was like, okay, cool, I will do that. And what I did, it was like, I grabbed the walls of the past exhibition and I make this kind of like simple paintings in the, the landscape paintings that they were toner transfers, acrylic, and a, a bunch of mixed media. Uh, so when I, I charge, when I, when, I, when, I, uh, when I really cash her promise of like using the whole museum is when like, I was like, okay, I wanna take every piece from the permanent collection that has to do with Manifest Destiny. And any time that a person tells, so I was like, why Europeans, whenever they take a picture of landscape, is sublime, and when Latinos do it, it's like picturesque, right? It's like, I just wanted to like see, I wanted to just like kind of capture all these things and be like, I don't need my paintings to be good. I just need to be fierce, right? It's a matter of protagonism, right? Which is like amazing because I thought this show would be a blockbuster in the way that like, I only make seven paintings or eight paintings, can travel everywhere, because you know every museum in America has a terrible permanent collection of American art, so you could just like fucking pick any shit from there and put it here, and then make this installation. It's so cheap, so good. Is it too cheap? Very. You already have half the installation in your fucking thing. But since people don't like to recognize that, so like I offer it to like 20 museums, and everybody say no. Yeah. It's kind of funny, but 
I think they should. But also because they're like, you know, when you're a person of color or when you like study a lot or when you work really hard, you have to like become this weird honor to get in permanent collections. And then you go inside the bulbs and then there's like all this bullshit. Like it's just like an old lady from the town donate all the shit and all those guys are in the permanent collection. And then you are like $100,000 in debt for your MFA because you like you and then you finally made it. Some museum bought the shit. And there's all this bullshit inside. It's like kind of insane. But so I thought it would be a success and it didn't. So next 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 show. <laughs> and I and and then um Oh then uh, during that time, because I was thinking about protagonism, um, this poet, Claudia Rankin, um, he was organizing a show at the kitchen and asked me to make a video. Uh, and I was like, this is very cool. I really like your poems. And so I, I made this piece, which is like very quiet and stuff. But I, I OK, it's not short. Sure no. So I'm gonna just talk. I, I, I'm not whispering. I said very. I was I was um, talking really really fast because I did this video as a kind of stream of, a stream of consciousness. But also I was thinking about this piece called Side Recite by Gary Hill. It's one of my closest friends and really mentor. But also I was thinking about, um, you know, when I think about protagonism, right? At that time I was researching a lot about um, face recognition technology and how that is racist. So I was like thinking a lot about like, if you leave the camera in out of focus and you write a script for a lot of people of color, the camera is still not going to want to focus. We'll want to focus on the white person, right? This person is like, this, this, um, this movie is called Tetriari. It's like, Tetriari is the people in the movies that don't even have a speaking part, you know? Like clerk number one, clerk number four, right? So I was, I, was, I was going around these people rotating and they, I put this like kind of like um, rigorous looking old guy. So the camera keep like fucking with the focus and not, and not focusing because you want to focus on him and it's going to like keep, keep like messing up. So I was going around the, the while I was like freestyling. Mi cuerpo está determinado por la asociación con otros, como si fuéramos hermanos, sobrinos, primos que producen nada familiar. Nos extrañamos más con cada conexión. Solo el heredero de una apariencia, una presencia que disuelve con nuestras similitudes. Right. Then I did a show at the Orange County Museum where like a lot of the new photographic guys have done um, a lot of shows and take a lot of pictures, mostly in uh, Urbine. I don't know if you guys have been there and where it's usually Urbine, it's a shithole. It's like, it's amazingly sad. It's supposed to be the best place to live in America, but it's just the saddest place too. So uh, <laughs> you're from around there, but you're not from there. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Urban is kind of sad. It's behind the orange curtain. Yeah. It's behind the orange curtain. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but Louis Ball did a lot of photos there. And the scene is like, are you guys familiar with Louis Bolt? Louis Bolt, right? Good photographer, American, quintessential intellectual photographer. Is the closest to a German photographer that we have in our country, right? And and it's amazing because it's, a, it's actually I like it, right? And it's a he is like he is the what you consider a smart photographer. If you read the books about him, but then you look at the pictures and you have to question how is this a smart? Right? Like, it's a fair question when you ask, like, okay, how? Like, why? Because sometimes it's like we OD on our history and so on, like, if you would know that who was his parents, you would know that uh, if you read this thing. But sometimes the pictures are like, okay, how is this? Right? And to me, the main key of this smartness, right, is that like, they are totally engaging with American, the, the, the tradition of American abstract expressionism, right? So I was like, I was looking at his photos, and beside being highly aestheticized, I was like, this shit is a Franz Klein. It's totally a Robert Motherwell. They are like, they are engaging in a tradition of like representation. Um, you know, like, it's totally like, 
And then I, I read that book, and I was like, oh, this motherfucker stole my research. <laughs> so I was like, I, I mean, it's a very good book. I really, I really like it. It's, it's got a lot of flaws, but it's very interesting. And I mostly I got really hung up in this like, conspiracy theories about the abstract expressionism and the CIA, which is like then became like three different bodies of work. Um, so I was like, this is the only thing I allowed myself with this research and this project and this comp comparison is that like, I can go to the studio and as a photographer, think like a painter. Just like, I just can go and today I will make the coolest image I can come out with and that's all the job. That the, the whole job is trying to make it really pretty. And I took a lot of the elements, right? So I covered the whole studio with clay and when it cracked, so it could have all the elements of a Louis Ball paint, like it would look painterly, but it has all the materials, you know, the, the dirt and the structures of a Louis Ball's photo while trying to imitate some Franz Klein or some Robert Motherwell paintings, right? Um, so I just like, and, and I made like 18 of them, but it's really fun to just like go on every day just to think about what is the most interesting thing you can see through the viewfinder. And then I did another show where I kind of covered all the walls with this like mist of a... Um, um, Sumi ink, and then kind of like make it look like rain so the pictures could disappear onto the wall. And I, and, I, and I really wanted, I don't know, I wanted to camouflage the work in something that could feel photographic because I, I really want the experience of looking at art. No art, like I want people the experience of looking at my art. So it feels like, a, you know, it's like sometimes it's kind of complicated, but we have to create the conditions to look at the work. And it's sometimes very hard. I'm very rarely, I'm in group shows. And it's like, I'm very glad that when I get put in this massive show, I got my own room because it, it is very hard for my work to like be in dialogue. And I, that way I have, this is the first time I'm in, after like 150 shows and 10 years of making work, I have never been in a, a biennial or in a, in a group show like that. I have like, <laughs> like I just, some curators go to the office like, cool. Yeah, this is not gonna talk to anybody. This, <laughs> this word not gonna dialogue well with. Um, so I was just making this, um, yeah, kind of these installations with the work, which was very simple, right? And then, uh, oh, I got an Art Matters grant and I made this work with, uh, for the Portland Art Museum, was a solo I had here. And I was like thinking about internships and, um, I, like the whole project started as a joke. I was telling my friend like I was too broke to have a resume. I was like, because as I, as I went all to school, I was like, like if you, like I can, I never cross my mind internships, right? I, like I'm not gonna work for free for anybody. Like it's not gonna, I just know, I don't need a recommendation letter for somebody. Like I just, so, so this whole idea that like, you know, mostly in other parts of the art, like, if you can go to New York and be an intern in a gallery or like be somebody's assistant for like for free for a year, then they can write your recommendation letter that you can do into grad school and then you're successful. It's such an illusion and so, such a bullshit, but like it, capitalism becomes this endurance contest where you have to be fit, economically fit to win, right? So I was considering this analogy of like, you know, so I basically make a platform where people were like, doing planks, basically. So the camera was in the ceiling, and there was a green screen in the bottom, and I just wanted to, like, the camera to float around these people, like, kind of like they're in the ether, they're in, in no man's land, these young people just kind of struggling with their own weight. And the projection in the, in, the, in the museum was, like, very large, so you can really make eye contact with these guys and just kind of experience kind of, like, how long they want to hold it, right? And it's, you, are, you are in this endurance competition with money and how long you can handle you know, leave a cherry food and not, you know, until eventually everybody says, I just gonna get a job in Omaha. Just gonna go to like get a job somewhere and then like. So yeah, the whole movie is very slow and it's like this zooming into these young people's faces. Um, and again, it's all people searching for internships and stuff like that. So the second part of the, uh, the conspiracy theory thing is was uh, thinking about, um, this is Brasilia, Oscar Niemeyer, masterpiece of weirdness. If you guys have the chance to, to, to visit Brazil, um, Brasilia is like 
a, a, a visual experience. It's really, really, really weird town. Um, so I was thinking that I made a weird correlation that like when brutalism is uh, and, and you know, start really happening in Latin America. Also, every country had a dictatorship, so I was like, this is a Trojan horse. Like, I was like, I was thinking about, a lot about the brutalist aesthetic in relationship to, to dictatorships. Um, again, this is like weird influences, right? The Merzbo, uh, you know, this is um, Gonzalo Fonseca. There is a lot of like, Max Cern. I will show you something, for the, for, mostly for the artists, for the other people, you know. I've been trying to rip off Max Ern, I, I love him. I don't know for no re for no reason. They have no reference. I mean, I, his poetry is okay. The paintings are good sometimes, but I really, really love him so much. Um, and um, so all these are influences, right? Um, so I start making these little kind of like creatures, slash kind of like brutalist monsters. In a, in, a, in a concealed room of concrete. Um, I was casting a lot of like trash I found in the street from like electrodomestics. And I was making these molds and then kind of like MacGyver them or Frankenstein them into something. And then I made them as a photographer, which is like the oldest way to reproduce prints. Um, so sometimes it's very, very simple, right? It's like a, one of those like a television casing that come and a speaker casing as a negative space and then you fill them with concrete and sand them, make them nice and then take this very kind of like ominous pictures that look almost monumental but it's actually, you know, 48 by 48 stage of these things that they, but it's odd, odd, like even the negative spaces of capitalism feels familiar to us. And feels alien, it feels mystical, and feels like a higher knowledge in some way where like we are like so dominated by these things. Right? Uh, but I will tell you, I keep look at this guy, right? The Capricorn. You can if you go to LACMA, you can see it. And and you can tell that um there he is, right? I guess I can be like you can tell that like um there he is. You know, like I just keep trying to imitate that. Ch I don't know. Like I really like it. It's in every picture now, forever. It's just like I always kind of like try to rip off Max Ern, which is like, you know, she's never going to come for me. <laughs> so the photograph works also is like kind of like a handmade Photoshop too. So it's very beautiful. And I wanted to make, because I was working with concrete, seems silly, but I really wanted to like a print that feels the weight in the paper. It's very beautiful. And then for the show, I cover, I raised the floor of the, the, of the gallery like uh, two feet, and then I made these holes. This is like 2019, I think. Um, and then I made a hole, um, and I made the ceramics. So you walk around and you hear your feet, and I, sometimes it's silly, but uh, one again, creating the conditions to look at your work, right? Um, like sometimes you don't need good actors if you want to perform, if you want to make a, you know, want a scene, right? Or you want to make them feel awkward. Just shoot the actors in an elevator, right? Everybody, no one has a comfortable conversation in an elevator, right? So you have to figure out how to create the conditions for something to feel like you want it to feel, right? And listen to your steps and looking down, looking some, doing something with your body, it really makes you aware that you're looking at art or you're looking at something. And that kind of gets you like kind of juices flowing in your brain and really help you to understand the work. If you just walk inside and you see a white wall and then like, like happen now, it's very easy to dismiss these works in some way. Like when you look at the stray up and then leave, it feels like, oh, I saw one, I saw a lot. But when you have to like hear your steps, look down, look up, it's, it really something happened. I made these ceramic pieces too. And then the th last part of the show, uh, the last of this like trilogy is like when I was thinking about modernism in terms of like labor unions and like the beginning of uh, industrialization in America. So I have all this like, I, I also I was doing the residency at the, um, at the Smithsonian. So I had access to a lot of different archives of uh, labor unions and American industry. 
So I was just collecting all these images, and there, some of them were weird. But again, because painting is kind of like a, a big, deep influence, this is Wilfredo Lam, um, a Cuban painter that immigrated to Paris and then to New York, very important surrealist painter. And then also Roberto Mata, which is a big influence for me as a Chilean person, which is like, we have like five people that are famous. So this is like, it's like, um, so I was like, so when you look at the reference, you know, this is it, now you hear, but like when you look at the work, it looked like a sci-fi movie, a reference, whatever. But now that I show you the reference, you can see that like it's, it's not a lot of creativity in some ways. It's like, you just kind of really try to follow the spirit of what I was thinking. And like how to, sometimes it's just imitation, sometimes it's like, but it's a straight up like the feeling of a, um, of a matter with the ideology of the photographs. I really wanted to search something that feels kind of like, kind of cohesive to me in all these things that I'm, I care. And sometimes when I'm making this work, I mean, already thought the decisions. I want to make it look like a mata. I'm thinking a lot about the, the images of um, industry, but also I'm thinking a lot about movies, right? I'm like, I'm going to make one about a stalker from Tarkovsky, right? I'm going to make one like look like Solaris set, right? I, I just like will think a lot about cinema the whole time. I'm going to make one that looks like Metropolis, right? Um, that one, yeah. Um, and all this kind of modernist idea, like a post-apocalyptic war of like workers and you know industry, that is very like this. And then last year I made this show that was like the, the the actual show that I wanted to make with all the work, where I have like, if you look at these works, right now the Wilfredo Lam influences are very very clear, right? Like this kind of stuff. I decided that those monsters could be weapons. And they could engage in dialogue with this, like, maybe the workers of these factories have left and they build weapons. And these weapons also have some sort of anthropomorphic quality. Again, it's like, does nothing have to be real. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just kind of like imagination need to lead in some way the possibilities of something. And I don't want, a, some, I don't want this like, violent work, right? It's just one of the possibilities. And that's what happened to be more interesting aesthetically for me to make at the time. Um, um, so I just basically built this stage where, and then every screen print had these time cards, the ones that you used to check into work. And I made these screen prints with the photos I took of the objects. Uh, I'm making right now a book in, in, in ROM um, that is going to be ready in a, probably in like a month more with all these uh, screen prints and the images, this is a show at Patricia Reddy Gallery in Santiago, Chile, was the first time. The pandemic hit it, so like I was like, it, it was like no one saw it, which is like the second time that happened to me. Like the first time I had a solo show in the museum and they went on a strike and it was closed the whole time. And then I arrived and then they reclosed the country again. So I was in quarantine for seven days in a hotel. I left the hotel straight to install. I finished the install, and next day the government was like, mm, we're going to close everything again. So again, second time, nobody ever saw the show. So I'm huge in Chile. So yeah, here you can see a little bit of the time cards and the, 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 the creatures I make. Um, yeah, so these are the kind of the photos of the objects that I, I end up screen printing. Uh, now, uh, I, again, kind of did a dictatorship and stuff like that. I was thinking a lot about, uh, um, not necessarily about Chilean dictatorship or some problems like that. I was really thinking about, um, so the whole idea came from kind of researching about something I like, the history of punk and the history of like youth rebellion. But it's mostly about youth rebellion, right? It's like, what really means to be a deviant from the general culture? And also, um, who, like I feel that we go to museums and we these things that we say they're knowledge, but it's information. And I think we come to make work with very little wisdom. Like we don't really take in consideration everything that we have learned to make work when we make work. And it's very hard to do it, but I think like, you know, that's why I think when I make installation, considering the body, considering music, 
consume cinema. It's all these things that they're not only just like a smart people thing to do or say. It's just kind of like the things that you do in the everyday life. Right? So I was thinking that like, uh, it has to be a museum that is a place for wisdom, right? Not for pure information. So I was thinking, I just need to make uh, something that looks like a natural history museum for, gest for body gestures, for hand gestures, for things that they will be like, pew, pew, like, come on, like, uh, you know, like the weird gestures that we do with our bodies, right? Mostly pictures I have from punk concerts, from protests, and all these things that, um, so you just like, like just thinking. Because eventually, you know, when, when I was a kid, um, well, not that MTV was big, right? And, uh, and, and I remember that like was normal on TV that I have like Sepultura on the radio, so Metallica on the radios, right? So there was a lot of norm, normal people being like a, like a metalhead, right? And so, and it was very normal to hear these bands like, you know, in the radio station like Fugazi or whatever. So it's like, but now eventually no, like, you know, so this gesture will disappear of the, like in, in 10 more years, like no one will ever do this, right? There's no need to do this. So somebody need to categorize it and archive it and like be sure that people understand that this meant something. <laughs> you know, so like you just have to like figure out the way to like think about gestures and like kind of archive them and like, and I mean, they happen when you hear your dad saying some weird insult, you are like, is it an insult? <laughs> you know, it's just something that he said, but it was a big deal. Like you watch gangster movies, it's like, it's weird when they say something like, okay, shoot, wise guy. And you're like, is it, was it, was it like a thing that people got mad and they wanted to shoot you for? So like the insult, the way we talk, the way we express ourselves, the way, like I think they have to be a, a system, right? So I just decided to make this kind of like weird, ritualistic museum of gestures that they're very kind of like a playground for this, all these moves to happen. So, and that is the show that started, and now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have to kind of rush it, but if you have uh, any questions or doubts, it's, it's cool. I mean, any, any question? Any doubts? Doubts are better than questions. <sighs> Julia, just ask anything. Um, thank you so much. That was really great and uh, really extensive. And I know that we've we've all been here a bit, but maybe there's. I know that you were open to entertaining just a few minutes yeah. because I'm sure there's still some questions, and we're all engaged here. So is there anybody who wants to ask a question about? No, they have oh. questions. So. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have you use this because it's tied into the talk. Yeah, hey, um, I was just curious, like, uh, could you talk about if you feel strongly that your photography is contemporary. Uh, something that struck me while I was watching this is just, I mean, and going through all of these is like sort of the deep historical kind of like context that kind of feels like comes up in so much of this photography. You're like, I, like, and I'm like, I'm, I recognize I'm like a nobody, but I don't really like contemporary photography, but I was very impressed by a lot of this. I'm like, oh yeah, I was thinking about like is just it, is this it? old stuff. So I don't know, I'm curious about, curious about that. So you say yeah, you, don't, you like it, but you can recognize that it's not cool enough to be playing with the cool guys. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I mean, I suffer the same. You know, I tell you, I, I, that's why I don't get a lot of stuff with photography, because <clears throat> if I was taking, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I can talk shit about a lot of people, but it is like, yeah, there is a, there is a type of photography that register as contemporary. There is things that register as contemporary, right? But also, it may be that you're also pursuing contemporaneous. So I think, I think you have to be, I don't make it look old. You know, the reason why I mostly shoot black and white is because I develop myself and I can work really fast and I, not, I don't depend on laughs. And as you see, like, and it's a little bit of like the, the anxiety of being a worker. It's like, I drop the work here. I'm staying here tonight on like tomorrow morning. I'm gonna deinstall, I'm gonna chip, I'm gonna pack everything, I'm gonna chip it, I make every frame, I print every photo, I develop every role, 
right? That doesn't see in the word, but there is like no one that like they, I understand something about the next print that I can make because I have touched it, I have a look at it closer, and I hold, I know how they're gonna resist weather, little things like that, right? So, yeah, sometimes they don't register as cool, and I wish they could be cool because there is plenty of magazines and things like that that they give awards. I mean, Aperture just had a gala a couple of weeks, couple of days ago, and like. I have never been in one of these, and I don't want to because I don't drink and I get sleepy really early, but it is like, it's interesting. It's interesting what registered for you as contemporary, but I still like that is a question for yourself, not for like to be answered. It's like, what is cool? And I think if there's something that looks objectively cool and this is not it, but you love it, then you have to start more questioning why you love it and what is the what is the other cool thing that you would not to be cool like why you don't want to be cool right what is really cool like I know you can enter in a lot of like etymological concerns about like your own taste and like question the ontology of your feelings and then uh, uh, but I think it's very important to um, Again, kind of form your own path about research and kind of like and this interest and like I'm just interested in the things I'm interested in. and I've been interested in labor unions and working class issues and then I try to make, I try to teach myself new techniques for every show. Like I didn't know how to screen print until I taught myself how to screen print. So this one came out great, but the first one from the show that I did, like when I made this one first, I was like, oh, this is not that good, but it's kind of interesting. So in the beginning, they were not great. And then I got really, really ambitious. But also, you know, you mix ambition, right? Because, and so at the time when I was getting ready for this show, I was doing a residency at the, um, at the Dora Mar. You know who is Dora Mar? It's, it's a photographer that it was Picasso's mistress. <laughs> she was very interesting artist and kind of part of the surrealist movement. And she was a muse for a lot of people but she also did all the documentation when Picasso was doing Guernica. So I had access to a lot of the archives where she was like all the contact sheet and all the kind of notebooks and like a lot of the books. And actually it was sleeping in her bedroom. It was kind of weird and like I was there for like two months, a uh, couple of summers ago. So I was very inspired by this also, this like what is an image of war and what is an image that commemorate pain of, of fear. And so I was taking a lot of these muralists you know, which also was like, it's still part of the conversation, right? When, because if you think about like Rivera or Siqueiros, you really, um, um, you really have to think that they were big inspiration for American abstract expressionism. And they were big influence for Pollock and Rothko. And like a lot of those people start from, they, they get started as a full-time artist with national programs, right? Like, uh, so, so there is a lot of the American ideology is terribly subsidized by something that looks a lot like so, uh, like socialism when you are trying to fight communism everywhere, right? But it's very far few. Socialism in America is very few selected group that get it, right? So you can make a lot of connection, but that is kind of how my head is going all the time. I just thinking a lot about this the connections between all the, um, you know, again, from the same, from an older world that has um, not a relationship to it, but that I can connect it to the older world all the, all the two series ago because I'm consistently thinking about like how things are talking and how things I can relate it. And then the techniques are part of it, right? There's a propaganda, a screen print is since the right, screen printing since the right medium for a propaganda machine, right? The time card seems to be the popular gesture for the worker, right? And again, the, the mural is like the thing that was popular during that time. So I was like kind of mixing it and, and just look how it looks. And sometimes it doesn't look super contemporary, but also look like not a lot of people are doing it. So it's just gonna, even if it's shitty, it's gonna be you, you work, you know? And I only, and I still doesn't look like all the things I wanted to look, but I really insist in kind of figure out through the research and my instincts and the, my skills that come from other times, right? Working construction, um, or working cleaning and stuff. I think like this, there's a lot of things that are gonna come into play, but um, yeah. I don't know if that answer, but yeah, there is no point to search for contemporaneous, and if you don't like it, it just says something more about, you have to evaluate 
what is the thing that you say that you don't like when you're saying that? We've got one question here and then one more over here. Hi. Oh, gosh, Hi. very loud. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just learning about your work for the first time, and seeing it in this format is really interesting. I feel, like, very agitated by it in this, like, perfect way. And especially watching um, the piece you made with the, the maids. Yeah. And thinking about, you know, how you've gathered this group of people together and asking them to do something that's completely outside of their comfort zone. And I'm really wondering, like, first of all, how you approached them and what that experience was like of asking them to do something so, you know, outside of anything they'd probably thought about doing before. And then kind of what was that relational experience of being in this setting where there's, yeah, this group of people who don't really know each other yeah. and don't know the work are kind of producing this version of acting. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the question I think you are asking really is, um, is like how we generate social trust, right? Or how we get to know each other. Uh, but because I think this is the thing, I mean, what I was saying earlier about knowledge, right? It's like uh, students ask you, tell me what I need to read to know this one thing, right? But and, and a lot of people are bad at getting interviews of people talking about to other people because there is no, uh, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? So like you need to be as generous as you want people to be generous with you, right? And we know it in regular life, but with art, it's very hard, right? I say it as a, not, not as a joke, but like, I mean, as a weird comment, right? I feel that, um, like, uh, because artists are so strong-minded sometimes, and they believe that they're smart, and then there's a lot of things. So it, it's almost like an apology, like, a, like making good art is almost like, a, or like what I consider good art is almost like being really good at apologizing. You know what I mean? Are you guys good at apologizing? <laughs> no? You don't consider yourself good at apologizing? But you know what I mean? Like, like it's not enough saying I'm sorry, right? It's like you have to learn how to put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand what you did and how they make them feel. And if you're not good at that thing, it's going to be very hard, you know, to apologize, to build relationships, or to, like, or to really make art, right? So if you consider that if you need to know personal information about somebody, you got to give them something from you first. So that way, a lot of the time, I, I will hire people that I know something about what they're passing through, right? So if I'm not willing to tell them my experience, and usually that's how I start. I talked a lot about them, like how I came, what I have, that my mom clean houses, that, you know, and then they're like building a trust where like, the people will know that, you know, like if I want to, like, where you get that shirt, or you got it, like maybe I have been the place where you got it. It's a good, you know, whatever it is, I need to be able to tell you something about myself at the same time I'm requesting something from you, right? That this information is not just like, just like sucking up your knowledge and then I'm leaving, right? It could happen that if you pay them a lot of money, but most likely uh, with, the, with a, with with a price, you will passively buy their time and their attention, but you're still not going to buy their trust. So it's a exchange. It's a very clear exchange where, like, where, you know, the first piece, the one that uh, I didn't get to show you, it is like I was, I interviewed all these young immigrants, and I was telling them my story, and then they tell me their story. But this is it. You are in the art context but you can't be fucking talking about art with them, right? You can't even ask them the question that you want to ask them. You have to get there, right? And if you wanted to know how, how high-minded you are, you, if you want to talk to about young immigrants about something, you got to talk about drinking, girls, you know, things that they are, rela they, they are relatable to them, right? 
So I can I gonna tell them about like how I got married for the green card and I got I got divorced and how I you know I, how much I used to drink and the time I, I fell asleep in the plaza stuff like that and I build and then they feel they told me their stories about that situation and eventually I get to the point of how lonely they are right and that is how you know like if you wanna make work about like immigration like because I have been there I was one of those guys waiting for work outside Home Depot like uh, if you wanna make work about it like yeah, some people that really care about political issues maybe you're going to make work about the kids in the cages in the border. But if you actually really been an immigrant, you probably are talking about being sad and horny all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, imagine for you guys how hard it is to go on a regular date. Now picture yourself not legal, n being broke and not knowing the language. You think a lot of people are just jumping to go on there, and that is going to be a year, two years, right? So how much, and doesn't matter how how you look or how broke, everybody needs a hug, anybody needs attention, right? So you accumulate this pent up desires. So every dude that is waking out, waiting outside Home Depot, it's just like have all this pent up desire, right? So if you only know it when you are like talk to them and understand the situation, right? So really immigration has a lot more to do with loneliness and longing and a lot of these areas that like about political reform. I mean, at least for me. Which I could be, like, you know, if you, yeah, eventually if you have a good job, if you have a job that pays you enough money and nobody's abusing you and you have love in the house, who cares about a green car? You know, who cares about what Trump's saying? You know, like, it's just like really, you could like be annoyed at it, but you could be a lot, you know, but there is this weird stuff. So when I talk to them, you will talk about that, you know, and you will be share something and then they share something back and then you build trust like that. So that is kind of like, the that is a long answer. I, I think you started to get at this, perhaps, with what you were just talking about. But um, this is the first time I've seen your video work. I've, I'm familiar with your photography. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between those two media for you. Um, Oh, that is so hard. I'm sorry. I see a lot of no. cinematic references in your photography, but there are no yeah. people. And then the video work is just looks so different, but I'm starting to see connections as I hear you talk more about how they might feed each other. Yeah, I love seeing like video and photography working together, so I'd love to hear a little bit. Um, so. Okay, so people have agency, so you have to let them be themselves. Materials don't have that much. They have cultural gravitas sometimes. They have usage, right? So you, can, you have to move those things and kind of build this alphabet. You have to create a syntax between the objects and their use and their consciousness and their like, popular use and, the, you know, and their professional use and whatever it is the thing, right? I, I don't want to do that with people, but they do have the way. So I do have to be aware of those two things. I just have to let people be people and object be object, but in the, in the way that like, I, in the, all the movies, I stay to the distance. I want them to interact and be themselves. With the object, I stay steady. The camera moves a lot. With the object, I stay steady because I need to think about the object. I need to see how they present themselves. So if I'm moving the camera, I'm thinking about photography. If I don't move the camera, I'm thinking about how they are performing for the camera, how, what they're saying when they present themselves to me. So with the video, I just have to be quiet and let people be, and then eventually in the editing room, respect what I think their intentions were when they were saying that. So is, that is the, the relationship that like, I, I wouldn't want to move the camera. I wouldn't want to like shoot people as like, as I shoot object because I really pursuing how they are feeling and I don't want to move the camera because I care about how they perform. And that's, that is the big difference and the big connection between those two. Is that good? Are you mildly satisfied? Yeah, that's a really unexpected answer. I like oh. it. What are you were expecting? Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say. <laughs> yeah. OK, I think we have to wrap it up with this last question over here. Um. Can you maybe talk a little bit about, um, it sounds like you, like, you are a part of the art like, through the whole process and like, talking a little bit about like, 
why installation and stuff is like important to you? And like, does that have to do with, I, you said you met with another student who felt like they had to produce and had to be working? Like, is that something like where you feel like you like have to have like a hand at everything and like I don't know. <laughs> I think I mentioned it earlier a little bit uh, the, the anxiety of not showing that I work really hard it may be crazy but you know I, I don't know like I can also because the work doesn't read very well if I don't create the conditions for that. Um, yeah I, I think it has to do with controlling the situations where the work is presented and read and felt um, yeah, I think the installations can lead, you know, like when you do historical works or intellectually driven work, sometimes it's not associated with feelings, but it is like, it's the kind of like, kind of very mediocre mentality of thinking that, you know, thoughts have no feelings and feelings have no thoughts, right? So like, I think you can have a smart feelings and you can have dumb feelings. And so I think it's like, you can create those conditions with installation. And I think if you, you know, the lighting, the, the music, the sound, the smells, is, is very part of the whole thing. So I mostly create installations because maybe I have terrible doubt that people are not gonna get the one, the one picture, but also it's just like, yeah, I really like working. And so I feel like I, I fantasize a lot with all the possibilities that I can think of. And some, some of the installation, for example, the floor of this work, um, became the installation, becomes the box. So I recycle all the, because this box, this box is, was the floor. And I just recycle all the installation. And I still kind of like the last show, this is still the last bit of the good being good enough to like another shoot of nails and screws and stuff like that. But that, that, that new work is still is with like random pieces of stuff, leftovers. Um, I don't think I have it here, but yeah, some of the shapes I have, you know, some of the shapes I have there, I discovered, the, I, dis I figured out how to make it and I started thinking about the work because I was making these things with my shape in my arms and kind of making weapons. So I was also, when I was started thinking about the gesture, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this one thing I did in this other show, in this other body of work, and I, because I learned and I like how it looks. So I wanna start using the same plaster-based gas to wrap my body and I start making the gestures. But I, it's something I discover because I have leftovers for one body of work and then I kind of think about, yeah, it's, I, I treat a lot of the work and the, no, the, the things as a, as a um, kind of stepping stones, right? Uh, or like, yeah, rhizomatically, if you wanna be more. I just think one thing, create the others and I just like kind of pedal uh, the thing. Okay, good. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much.